All right, I want you to think back to uh, your now you're talking to to both, both of you, right? Both of you right now. Okay. So I want you to think back to your younger days, and I want you to think of um, a dress that you had. It can be when you were a kid, or when you were a teenager, or in your twenties that you were very proud of. You know, that I mean you really loved this dress, and I want you to describe the dress. Can you remember one? I can. Well, I can't. My grand grandmother used to make the last clothes for me, and really. Uh, right now, I can't even remember one of them. Well, I had well a, you start off, and then you know, when you come in. I had a dress bought for me. I think I was going to a wedding. I would have been about 10 or christening wedding. And it was <clears throat> sort of taffeta. And it, it was a, a aqua, and it had little flowers all over it. And I was very proud because it had a nice frill on the bottom. <laughs> Quite a small frill. And I loved, really felt really good in this dress. And of course, I wasn't, only, I was only allowed to wear it if we were going anywhere. And of course, by the next summer, when it could be worn, I'd really grown out of it. But then I was told I could wear it as wool. So <laughs> it really was not very comfortable. I was sort of bursting out of the seams. <laughs> and, uh, that, that was, was the rule, wasn't it? Yes. You so, wore yeah. them. For your best. Yes, right. And then well, it becomes, oh, you go to school in it. <laughs> that was good. Yeah, I said, I was going to wear this yeah. to school, and when I tried it on, I was, it was right. well, difficult to breathe, you know. So, how old were you when, when this was new? About 10, I think. Oh. Yes. Uh, so. mm -hmm. Now, can you think of one, you know, like going to a dance, say, like in your 20s or during the war? A dress that you wore on a date, or you know, what was a dress I, that you really loved that you were really fond of when you were older? I may, I, when I came out of the service, I started to make some of my clothes, and I made one that I was quite proud of, or two actually, and uh, it was very pretty color tan again with flowers and a tight way, you know, tight on a band around the waist and. Uh, I was quite pleased with that, and um, I kept my hair in a long page boy, you know, and this dress with the tight waistband, <laughs> I thought I was the cat's whiskers. <laughs> and, uh, and another one, in fact I have a picture somewhere of me in this other dress, which was, uh, I splashed out in the West End and bought a very expensive, expensive relatively expensive French gingham and made myself, the, the uh, new look was in, so it was a little long. And I made the skirt very, very full and put a black peaky collar on it. And I thought it was the cat's whiskers. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> well, when Do you I remember went... going into the, into the longer dresses? No, I can't even remember that. But, but one of my favorite things, clothes, because I was grown up then, was a herringbone tailor-made suit. You know the skirt and jacket, mm -hmm. and I wore that for years and years. And years. Mind you, it cost me a fortune. I know. Yeah. I had a bird. I had you a pay for it, and then you come to Dad to lend you the money. You know? <laughs> I had a bird's eye one that I bought actually. Yeah, in the but there was bird's eye or herringbone. Yeah, wasn't very fashion, straight, yeah. very straight right. skirt and a cut jacket. Yeah. I, I wore that a lot too. That oh, was I love that suit with nice blouses. From the uh, from the West End, it's. Uh, all right, well now Harold, here's another question. Um, think about who was the first boy you had a crush on? Ooh. Don't think I ran for crushes very much. <laughs> no, no, I don't think I did. Not as far as that went, no. no a couple had a crush on me, but... Well, who, we'll, tell, we'll tell about one of them then. Well, he was these that knew it all, number one. <laughs> <laughs> that one did so not he wasn't going to go very far anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I remember we've only ever had one dance at school and it was a big deal. And I had a, oh yes, I had a white satin dress for that. It wasn't long, but it was, yeah, and it, the, the skirt was in three tiers. Oh, yeah. And I had a, a scarlet 
sash with a big bow at the back of the sash was that wide. <laughs> Very <laughs> full with it. <laughs> and I, a boy asked me to go with him to the, and I rather liked this boy, he was quite nice. And not actually a crush, but he was quite a nice boy. Never saw him again. <laughs> Never read out or anything like that. There wasn't a lot of that with the boys and girls at school. Well, Remember, we were only 15. That's what I say, don't forget. We weren't like we seniors. We were just kind of leaving school and we were six years with the war on, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So as far as clothes go, you know, we certainly didn't have as many as we would have done if then there had been a war on this. No, sure. Because after we I had coupons. Yeah. You had to buy your clothes with coupons then. But as I say, with leaving school, I mean, I went to a secondary school and I left at 15. Right. So, I mean, the general schools left at 14. Right. And high if you went, they were mostly between 15 and 16 when I left and I was a little under average age. So, we were much younger for our age then, where there wasn't the thought between going out with boys very much. Not, not at that age, no. So what were the dances like that you went to during the war? And I mean, you told me, last night I was down, you were telling me about some of the dances you used to go Well, to. The, there was a dance, and it was just a big hall, and sometimes you saw a lot of the people, you know, regulars that went there. And that's where I actually met Hattie, I mean, Ooh. at this dance hall. Was he a good dancer? He thought he was. <laughs> <laughs> Did you think he no, was? No, I never. <laughs> he was one of these that liked to do these silly little fancy steps. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, he thought he was a great dancer. Are you kidding? <laughs> but he well, wasn't. <laughs> the dances, we went to a lot of them, were well, nearly all local dances. Did you do jitterbugging? Oh yeah. A little. I, I did more just jive. I didn't do a lot of straight, no, not yeah. getting thrown about jitterbugging, you know, jive, yeah. But... Did you do the thrown about jitterbugging? Huh? Did you know the kind where they throw you over their back and everything? Like hell they would. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was stayed on my two feet. <laughs> you did no. mostly jive where you throw yeah, out. Yeah, right, right. But they were... You used to go there, obviously, to meet boys. They, well, they that's what you one. went there for, yeah. It was... Uh, they were usually a big sociable crowd, you know. No, no drinking or anything like sometimes that. Sometimes you'd go and you'd say you'd make a date for the following day, perhaps it was a Sunday yeah. or a Friday night, you could make one for Saturday. And then you probably wouldn't bother seeing them again. Right. <laughs> what did the boys drink? Drink? Oh yes, it was, yes, because we used to go to a very large dance hall and it was over a big public house. You couldn't take the drinks up to the, oh, no. to the dance floor. But they used to go down. But there was no drunkenness. I don't ever remember no, anyone being either. drunk. Never. No. They used to go to dogs, you know, and to meet girls, chat them up. <laughs> and, uh, so what were, you, what were your, uh, you know? what were your parents, did your parents ever have restrictions or was it just kind of understood that you'd be home at a certain time and you wouldn't oh, go no, out? No, I never had that. No, I didn't either, except that <laughs> my father got tired of me coming in so late and waking them up, he, he did at one time try to put his foot down. <laughs> Being here, I forget what well, the time I was. Well, that was cute. I used to go, but I used to go home with Enid and stay at her house. Oh, well, you <laughs> was not. I didn't have anyone near me. Because like the that. dance hall was near her house and mm -hmm. it was mine. Was that your friend? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. well, it's, it's she only had her mum waiting for us anyway, you know. I mean, even when I was going with Daddy, now I'd been away three years in the service, I was home, I was 26, and I've had Granddad yell down, it's time you came upstairs. <laughs> Uh-oh, I'm in trouble again. Mm. He never mentioned it any other time, but he would yell, I suppose I used to keep, we used to keep him awake talking and laughing, if it was cold, we used to be in the, in the downstairs. You know, 79 mm -hmm. Seymour we used to be down in the little hall, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I don't know. Was, uh, so I wanted, I, don't know, I was going to ask you both about um, the war. Oh. Now, you were both 14 when it yeah. started, right? Yeah, so coming up to 15. I was 15. Yeah, yeah well, you must have been about 15, the same year. Yeah. Same year. Well, you would have been 15 in February, and I was coming up to 15 yeah, as right. I left in September. Right. So you went into the Renz when you were 17? No, 19. I had to wait. So you were in London for four years. 
for during the war. Mm -hmm. And you you were in London all the time, Adrian, because you were yeah. working, right? Yeah. So, tell me about your place where you worked. What was what was that? Oh, I had a few jobs. Well, I had a few jobs. The last one I had. Uh, well, it went like this, you see. It used to be you could get called up. You know what that meant? You get called up and either to go into the service, right? Mm -hmm. Or do war work. So each group as it came, if if you were in that group, you had to join the service. There's no yes or no about it. You had to go. Because you were called up. My group, which you would have been in the same one, was to go on war work. So I worked in an aircraft factory not far from where I lived. And at that time, remember pay as you earn income tax? Sure. That was just beginning. Mm. And they were advertising for a person to do it. And I'd done office work anyway. And I got the job. So you were how old? Well, I was 15 when the war started. This was towards then, say, six. I mean, 20 or 21, something like that. So I did this job. I was there for, oh, a long time. Oh, well, a good bit during the war, doing this income tax. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I did that when I came out. That's what that's I where took I over met when Edith I came out there. of the service. But I was, I was, as I say, 15. I did a factory job for a while because it was near home. And then I went to work with Jill to a ch for a charge of accountant. And his office was up right by London Bridge. So bombing was getting pretty bad by then. So every day, uh, you know, it was getting, it used to be hard. You'd have the buses would take all turn at routes. Oh, you never yeah. knew where you were going. So they, so, they arrived, wouldn't, so they wouldn't be regular routes, so they wouldn't... Well, you felt that you were lucky well, they, if you got to work. Well, only you if You never they, knew if you were going to get on a bus and going, there were the Germans dropping bombs, right? Well, the they, siren would go. Yes, well, also what would happen was you'd go over in the morning one way, and when you came home at night it was all worked off because they'd found half a dozen unexploded bombs along yeah, on the route you'd just like come along. Mm. <laughs> but then we, Jill and I, uh, arrived one morning and the office was bombed. Yeah. Uh, and um, they probably tried to get London Bridge, it was very near the end of London Bridge. And uh, So were Nan and Greta nervous about you working so close to a landmark? Never really no, thought about it. Nobody thought about so it. To I tell mean, you, you truth, could have got it anywhere. Were, and everybody had the same saying. If there's one for me, I'll get it. It's got your name on it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what you used to think when you just get on the bus and think, well I don't think we actually thought about it at all. No, before. not really. You just not went here every day. I mean you, you had to. You 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 set out to go to work and I thought, uh oh, he's taken a different route, must be must be something yeah. happened on his normal route. I mean, they didn't just go anywhere. And they would only divert if it was something that happened on their route. Either buildings down or unexploded bombs that had been discovered and there'd been people working on them, you know. So when uh, when we the office was bombed, uh, Jill and I, uh, we got in touch with our boss who lived out in Highgate and he asked us to go in and start getting books and stuff together. And there was a young policeman. After it had been bombed? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't in absolute ruins, but part of it, part of the building was gone. But I bet the they didn't was, let you in. Well, a young policeman came to here and asked, where are you two going? Yeah, right. We said, the boss wants us to get some stuff out. So he said, wait a minute. So he came in and looked and he said, all right, those stairs are safe. You can go up. He said, if that siren goes and I don't see you out through this door, I'm coming in to get you. He said, because if there's gunfire or another near miss, this lot's going to come down. I can't believe they would have sent you in. You know? uh, That's so irresponsible. Everybody was doing it. I mean, it, you know, it, it was just one of those things. I mean, I, I learned how to bring people out of a burning building. I mean, you were expected to know these things. So both of your families had air raid shelters? Oh, yes. Did you go down every night? For when the blitz was on, yes. Well, I never. Well, finally in our street, they built two stone 
air raid shelters, you know, yeah, up ground them. Yeah, and uh, one was quite near our house. We did used to go into that at times. Mm. And then Enid and I, we used to go down to Wallingham, that's outside of London, for most of the weekends to her aunt. And then, not that they got any bombing, they used to come straight over to London. But, oh, I never liked those underground things. You ever oh. was in one of them? Um, well, we had an air, we had a... Oh, um, I hated them. What the Anderson. Yeah. We oh. had an Anderson shelter. It was did, built in the garden with the people in the family Yeah, I've seen those pictures. Did you, didn't, didn't, they, didn't they require you to do that? They found you above ground when they... Oh no, it's oh, no. your choice. It's just your choice. Yeah. So oh, did you not go down because you just felt like, you really felt like if you were going to go, you were going to go and you could stay at... I mean, did you have bombing close to you? We had a time bomb in this, that fell the street. Houses here, houses this side. The back of that street was the railroad. So we had a time bomb drop there one night, about three o'clock in the morning. So there, all the police come out. So we hear a whole street full, and quite a long street. We had to march from there up to a school with the air raid still, still going on. on. <laughs> no reason their pajamas. Yeah, you just got time to yeah, well, people put had on something quick sorts. and go. You know, didn't they? Most people had stuff they could put on over pajamas. Well, I had, I had a bag. Suits. I had a bag. I used to keep some jewellery and my makeup. Always had my makeup with me. <laughs> Always had my bag of makeup. I used to look at a pair of warm socks and a sock. Oh, I didn't and... care about the socks. I wanted the makeup with me. <laughs> yeah, I could. Oh, dear. Oh, that's funny. We used to share out with the family downstairs, the Pem Farms, you remember the Pem Farms? And, uh, oh, Nana had it all done. It went, they had to be covered by earth to absorb any shocks. And she had it all planted with flowers. <laughs> and our windows. It was very damp and cold down there. Our windows. Did you have the black up at your windows? Black material. Oh yes, black. Don't air dare curtains. turn on a light if you don't have black <laughs> blinds down. You've got someone the, thundering on the or door. Or you've got your windows covered up. Yeah. Oh, if, if the warning had gone, you know that means the Germans are on their way out over, and you looked out and somebody had just turned a light on without a black hole, oh, you'd hear the whole. <laughs> Screaming <laughs> and it was ridiculous, really, yeah. because if we only thought they could follow the Thames up yeah. into the moonlight night, I mean, yeah, it was like right. a world coming into London. They didn't yeah. need lights, <laughs> but um, yeah. it, it's uh, it, it was a strange time. It, in no, at no time, I was away from home in the service, I and mean, then I was four years in London from the time I was fifteen to the time I went into the Rens. And then three years in the rents, and at no time did I ever think what it was going to be like at the end of the war. No, you, I, don't think you I, never, I never thought to the end of the war, what am I going to do, or how is it going to be? Well, I think it was yeah. in us that we didn't know whether we were going to be around at the end of the war. I, I think you just took one day at a time, yeah, you did. and that was it. You didn't. I don't think you consciously said, I may be dead tomorrow, or yeah. anything like that. I think you just lived it as it came. So you never, neither one of you thought about what it would be like if the Germans came? Oh, yes, because... In a sense, I mean, yeah. you had, you in had right. um, Churchill saying, you know the famous speech, we'll fight in the roads, right. streets, we'll fight in the hills. And people thought like that, we would, we would. There was tremendous, very high morale. Oh, yeah. People would have fought to the last Tooth yeah. and nail, I think. Uh, people certainly felt like that. The only time that that really waned was during the buzz bombs. Oh, yeah, they were terrible. And morale, it was the only time I ever saw morale well. Do you remember people the first time you heard the buzz bombs? Do you remember the first time you heard the buzz bombs? Oh, yeah, they were scared. Of what was it like? And then the other things are. Uh, yeah, the, that to the one with the light on, right? The when light the light, you could the see up in the sky. And when the light went out on the tail of it, mm. it had to drop somewhere, yeah. and you could see it. And you couldn't tell which way it was you going. You couldn't tell which way it was going. They mm. cut out, and that was it. And then but after that, the, we, had, I the noise we had something else that we couldn't hear coming at all. Well, that was the that. rocket. Those were the rockets. 
The eight. rockets came first, didn't they? Was no, the they eight? came after those buzz think, bombs. Yeah, the eight. It wasn't no, buzz the, bomb, though. What did we call it? I called it a buzz bomb, yeah. No, there was another name to yeah, it. Yeah, there was another name to it. It was a D, it. what was it? I know, I, Maybe Ray will know, and I don't think it was a buzz bomb. I, we called them buzz bombs. Yeah, there was two, there's another name for it too that you recognise too that I can't think of what it is. I don't remember where I was talking about them. But, oh, um, oh, what was I going to say? Um, I can't think what it was. Well, they were rockets and then there were mines, like landmines. Do you remember hearing about the um, subway? You know, the bombing, where all the people were in the subway? Oh, yeah. oh, the bank, yeah. at the bank, yeah. Was that close to where you lived, Auntie Rita? Really? Not too far away. Yeah. What, so what part of London were you from? Northland. North. Yeah. So is are you near like Notting Hill that, or that? No, Notting not Hill is a good way. That's away. northwest, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how far were you or your homes apart from each other? Oh, a good way. I mean, where were you? I was e We were east. Right. So yeah, but we weren't very far from Clapton, and Clapton was north. So we were. Yeah, right, we, we right. were the northeast. Yeah. And, uh, oh, what, 20 minutes on the bus, 15, 20 yeah, minutes, something like that on the bus. Do you remember the first time a bomb dropped that you remember that was close to you? No, I don't remember hearing the first one. I remember hearing the gunfire, the day war was declared. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everybody thought that was all right. Yeah. Yeah. Was the well, they were just scaring you or just warning you? I don't know. Well, well they announced it on, who was the president? or whatever you called him over there, Prime Minister. That was Chamberlain. Then. He come on the radio television. And said, well, we knew that Did they... Did television then? No. No. Radio. He came on the radio and it said, "You, we are now at war. war that yeah. was it. Because we knew it was coming. We knew because it was they coming. Had, they had, uh, that he come and announced it. They announced and it from 11 o'clock. We were announced right away. The, the siren, siren went, went off. Not guns, it was the siren. <laughs> the sirens I went off. I beg your pardon, it wasn't guns, it was the siren. The siren went off, so we thought, yeah, there's the Germans coming up already. <laughs> 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 Give us time, you know. <laughs> but we just said we were all The guy next door was still digging in his, yeah, right. in his shelter. He was, they were digging like that. <laughs> <laughs> and that siren, because that was the siren that went when they knew the Germans were on the way over. It was a horrible sound, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, it was a terrible sound. Well, I told you, you so. know, and then of course you got organised into uh, uh, sitting in uh, uh, um, fire watching. Yeah, you know, you belonged, they got people and you took your turn every night. Oh, yeah, the men watching. that were like our fathers that were too old to go in the army and that, mm. they become volunteers, you know. What did they your dad do? Well, fire watching, everybody well, got fire into watching. Me. You fire watched, didn't you? No, I never fire watched. Well, everybody did in our street. No, my dad did. My God, everybody did. No, no, it was all the men. I fire would go. All the they kind of stood on the doorstep all night, you know, or most of the night. They were watching for in Watching bombs, to see if we should get out quick or but stay away. It was the incendiaries, a lot of it, too, because yeah. of the... But I fire... Because I know I've told you I fire watched with Auntie Pearl. Because she no, was... I didn't learn any of that. Right. Uncle Les had gone into the, no. into the army, and I went round to... Fire watch with her, you know. So, what what did your dad do? He just so he was just he was a fire watcher for. Was he a? Yeah, but didn't get paid. It was all voluntary. Yeah. These fathers, you know, they just was doing their bit for the war, you know. Yeah. I don't know why you just got your fathers into it. Everybody was into it yeah. that way. <laughs> because my sister was watching on her own. I mean, her husband was in the in the service. Everybody was on the fire watching list. Well. Johnny went in the Navy at 16, Oh, well, yeah, but, but I mean, you know, I mean, all the people in the... I don't think did he my stepmother did. Because twice he's done that. Yeah. Really? In England, and he lied here at 16 and went in the Navy here. Oh, the, oh uh, Johnny, not here. Uh, Keith. Oh, Keith, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, Keith was older than 16 when he went in, we. Uh, it was Johnny that went in at 16. No, but that was in London. Yeah. Keith has been in the service here. Yeah, yeah. 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 but he wasn't 16. Oh, no, he wasn't 16, no. but he's no. been in the Navy oh, he here. he was in the Navy, yeah. Mm -hmm. He would have been called up even though he wasn't an American citizen. Oh, sure. Right. And they knew that, but you still... And uh, so instead of them, well, he went and joined yeah. in the Navy. Yeah. That was... That was 
when you were talking about having the option uh, being called up for war work. No, that was in London. That was, was in London about, when, yeah. we were, where we were called up for it. Yeah. But I mean, I had the opportunity to volunteer for the service. Well, before you registered or what? You hadn't registered then? As I registered. No, we. It I used said I to wanted be. to go into the service. But as, and as you, you were doing war work in the factory. When, when you know, registered, you mean? You told you wanted to go to yeah. service? Yeah. Well, I, it made well, quite a few of us too, which were annoyed about it because they made us believe whatever group you come into, that's what you've got to go and do. So they wanted you to be at the office? No, they sent me in a bloody factory miles away. Oh, really? So what were you doing there? I wasn't there very long. <laughs> I, um, I was testing, uh, not lights. What do we call them? Valves that you have in wireless, isn't it? Yeah, valves. That's what That's they're called? Valves, yeah. Mm. Well, I was sitting in a machine doing that. But I only done about three days, and it was on a bus in the morning, well, I don't know if you know, way out Finchley Way. Mm, Goodbye. And this factory was in the, what do we call it, in, when it was in a lonely place. There was a word for it we used to use. Isolated? No, no. Like there used to be a slang word, or you're out in the... Oh, in the boondocks. The boondocks, right. <laughs> so I did three days and I didn't go back. And then I went back the following week for a couple of days. And I went to the doctor, my doctor, which was very easy. <laughs> and I told him that as soon as I got on that bus, I wanted to throw up. And... Um, I said, I get, oh, I've got a headache by the time I get there. So he gave me a nice paper with all this information on. So I went up to the Labour Exchange and uh, they give you a full medical. Mm -hmm. So she gave me this medical and then, uh, then you have to go in the next room for an interview. And she said, well, what's this all about? Well, I said, I just can't stay on those buses. I just have to get off sometimes and wait for another one to come and all that. And I said, I do, you know, have migraine headache. Migraine headaches a lot. So I came out with a paper saying, this person must have a job as near as possible where she lives. Which is what you wanted all along. Oh, I wanted that all along. <laughs> <laughs> so I finally I'm ended up in the that. aircraft factory, which wasn't very far away. It was in walking distance. And luckily they were advertising for somebody to do this new pay as you earn in contact. Mm -hmm. Bingo, I had it. <laughs> Home and dry. And that was my path. That was your award. <laughs> that was my gift I gave to the war. <laughs> Oh dear. Talk about lying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still here though. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Oh, I'm about to tell a few and during the war, let me tell you. <laughs> that was it. I've all these questions to ask. See, I told you you'd remember what I started talking. <laughs> well, yeah, some things you remember. Just bring it back. Oh, yeah, was I see, I was But it, you know, it was, it was difficult really because you were young and, and yeah. it was total blackout remember and always uh, even the actual really hard bombing that where we were down the shelter every night lasted just three months about 92 nights and that was you came home from night work, after night you ate your meal hardly had time there sometimes it had gone yeah. the ex-siren had gone and you went down the shelter. So what year was that? 40... Um, I think it was 41. I won't swear to that. That was pretty so early. It was, it it was, was pretty early. Yeah. Yeah. 
we had uh, we had the, like a long spell where sort of nothing happened. They called it the sort of phony war, and then then they started with the serious bombing. And uh, you really couldn't go out. I mean, you know, at one time uh, you didn't want to go out and be separated up from the family, you know, and then, because we were, we were young when it started. Yeah, I, mean, I they, did that. We wouldn't have gone truth. out. I wouldn't I have gone out. I went to the pictures a lot, yeah. No, I didn't, not until I was yeah, a bit older, then we did. Well, uh, so after the siren sounded, you would just go to the movies? Yeah. <laughs> and you were walking home, you say, well, well, not there for me, I'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> you couldn't think any different, I mean. So did people leave the movies if the siren sounded when the movie... No. We sat there and saw it through. <laughs> Waste our money. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> sat and saw it through. So what do you remember about the food in the war? Well, there were certain things that were rationed. Butter. Oh, a lot of things. Yes, I'm going to say, you name it, certain things. But then when you had a mother that was in with the butcher, <laughs> well, I can't say we done too bad. <laughs> my poor, we ate pretty good. <laughs> my poor stepmother used How did to you manage that? for hours. How did you manage that? Well, she used to slip in a few bob. <laughs> Besides, you had, you, you had a... You had a um, well, we were rationed. Yeah, I know you were rationed, but... We you never had, had enough had meat to keep us alive a week. Four mm. ounces a week. Right. Um, Four ounces of meat a week. Yeah. Four ounces of meat a week. And, we were a family uh, like of one, two, Poor stepmother four, racking five. her brains to know what she was going to put on the table, like every woman. Terrible but it was. But at one time, you've got to remember, bread was rationed. Meat, sugar, yeah. flour. Ran out of sugar, you had clothes, to have saccharines. Oh. Clothes. Clothes, uh, yeah. I don't think milk was ever rationed. No, I don't think milk one was. Year, one year, onions became short. <laughs> And we never and saw a banana during the war. Well, no, because they, they no, were only on we children's books. We did not books. see a banana. They were only on children's books, plus oranges also, yeah. on the children's green books. Was it amazing when you could children. get them again? Yes, oh, it was yeah. weird. <laughs> and, and, yes, and, and candy, of course, was rationed. And I remember after the war, uh, the first time they actually unrationed it, and I went in to a store and said, you know, can I have a bar or something? She said, oh, yes. And I said, can I have another one? She said, yes, of course. I was so amazed. <laughs> but from rationing, when I came home from, uh, came home on leave, uh, my stepmother came in one day so pleased because she'd lined up. And I mean, she, you, you know, she'd be out four hours in queues, lining up for this and lining up for that, you know. And uh, <clears throat> she came home so pleased with herself because she'd got some corned beef. And I... <laughs> I could have thrown up. We lived on corned beef in the yeah, service yeah. and scraped most. I felt so bad we scraped most of it down the chute, you know, because we didn't want to eat it. And uh, and she was so thrilled. But it was tough on them. It was I mean, tough. Now, the butchers that my mother went to, <laughs> they were of, of German descent. They you were from a, Germany. You had a slaughterhouse down the street, too. Down I know there we in did. Your world. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I remember you telling me. No um, wonder you were all And we knew somebody there that we used to get yeah, a bit of meat you too. Did. You told me. Uh, Alright, we should finish it because we've, we've got... Well, you should ask Johnny all about this. Yes, he's funny. We we'll want to take... Okay, here's the last question for... What was your favourite piece of jewellery during the war? During the war? Um, I never wore jewellery in the war. I had quite a bit, I can't remember. Even if I brought it with me. I, yeah, I have got it with me. It's a silver bracelet, quite wide. One of these that you slip on your arm and you do it up as a oh, buckle. Oh, a cuff, a cuff bracelet. Yeah, and it was all engraved. Mm. Mm. It wasn't my favourite, it probably was the only one I had. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I wore any jewellery at all. I wore jewellery, I remember that, I always had jewellery on. I think I we all wore a gold cross for a time. Do you remember oh, cross, yeah. Cross? On the chain, everybody had a gold cross on the chain. Remember. Then when I went into the service, you didn't wear jewelry at all. So, mm. well, thank you. That's great. <laughs> you did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> the you. war as you knew it. <laughs> 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 it's a bit spotty, but still. Yeah.
tell us um, where you were when you heard war was declared, and what, how you felt about it, what was the situation when you heard about it? Well, when war was declared, that was 3rd of September 1939, I was down at Ogmore, a, close, a, a seaside place in South Wales, which was being, uh, a coach was running a hotel there, and I was staying there for a couple of days. That was your uncle? Yes, my uncle, Coach. Coach. Um, I was just sort of hanging around there on a sort of unenforced vacation. And uh, I remember uh, the radio was on in the bar, and Chamberlain came through saying that uh, consequently this country is at war with Germany. But my first reaction was, was uh, I was really surprised and I was st stunned in a way. But I couldn't believe it, it couldn't believe it had happened. Um, and then I thought, well, how, what should I do? What is the best thing to do? And I thought, well, the best thing I can do is go back to Cardiff and see what the situation is there. When I got back, well, it was the 3rd of September, 4th of September, and I uh, decided I was, I was 18, I was 18 then. I decided the best thing I could do was to, was to join up, volunteer to, to, uh, for the Air Force. Um, I went down to this Air Force uh, uh, depot, um, was interviewed there, received the King's shelling, which, was, uh, which uh, confirmed the fact that I was now in the, in the Royal Air Force. And there were about 30 or 40 of us uh, all middling and milling around there. And the sergeant came out and said, we're going to march to the station now. And uh, I went to march in a dignified manner. No slouching or slopping and no smoking. No talking either. <laughs> so I thought this is a hell of a good start. This is, I must say. <laughs> anyway, we marched off there as best we could. And I remember thinking, I hope to God nobody, nobody sees me. Nobody sees me going down this, this, this scruffy looking bunch of herbits. Anyway, the next thing was we arrived at the, uh, the station there, pushed to, from pillar to post as it were. And I managed to get a, a, a carriage to myself, not to myself, but with four other fellows. And somebody said, where are we going? Any idea? Nobody, any, nobody had any idea where we were going at all. As it happens, we went to Uxbridge, a town in the, in the south, the southwest of, Wales, of, of um, England. Okay, so hold on a minute. So why did you choose the Air Force, particularly? Oh, I, well, I thought it, it was, I don't know, particularly good. I thought maybe I had a chance of flying. Of course, I don't have the fat chance I had of having as short sighted as a bat, but uh, it seemed to be, it seemed to be certain, a, a glamorous sort of uh, 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 service to belong to. So did, did, to your, did your family know you were going to enlist and you were going to be going to Uxbridge? I told Doris at that time. No, I, I didn't tell her. I told her I came back to the house I told her I had enlisted. And I, her first reaction was, you're a damn idiot. <laughs> it was uh, Angelina? Well, I told, I told Lena later on. I can't remember why, why or when. Doris said you're a dancer. I told Doris, yes, that uh, I didn't lift it. Anyway, then. Uh, why does she have that reaction? Pardon? She just didn't think the war was worth. Well, why does she have that reaction? Do you think? Because I was a damned idiot. <laughs> I don't know. I was thinking the idea that uh, I get going off to war, and being killed, that sort of thing, probably. But uh, I. I it, was, it certainly seemed to be a more glamorous sort of service than the others. Um, the Navy didn't, didn't, I didn't strike the Navy at all because it's, uh, there was so much bloody hard work about that. <laughs> Run, running around all over the place with packs of packs of 50 pounds on your back, the hell with that. So, um, and the army was too, was too much a ditch digging for my liking. No, anyway... Uh, uh, to a long line of hard workers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you might, you might say that. I, 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 I imagine it would be a more comfortable position to be in than anywhere, anywhere else. Anything else. So, uh, got, got a uniform, um, which was terrible, like a, like a sack. Uh, and which irritated me. It, it was it, very irritating. Itchy, surgy, surgy sort of stuff. Um, and we were sent then to Bridge North in the north of Wales for training, for basic training. Well, it was all new to me at the time, and uh, it was interesting in a way. It was certainly interesting in a way. Never knew what the, what the hell what was, was going to happen next. Um, 
And I remember one incident, I, was, I thought I was going to take a shower. And I, I just wrapped a towel around me and uh, went across to where the showers were. And uh, I said to a chap coming up there, is this the right way to the shower bus? And he stood looking at me, he said, what? I said, is this the right way to the shower bus? He said, what? I said, is this the right way to the shower? I think he was an idiot, that sort. <laughs> and he said, do you know what, see these stripes, these stripes on my, on my sleeve? I said, yes. He said, do you know what they are? I said, no, I have the faintest idea. He said, I'm a corporal. And I thought, well, good things. He said, when you speak to an NC, a non-commissioned officer, stand to attention. So there I was, standing stark naked, a part of a tower crusher on my middle, standing to attention as best I could. <laughs> Bloody idiot. <laughs> anyway, uh, then there's basic training. Well, everything happened in basic training. You, you made wrong salutes, you, you turned the letters to the right. Uh, you kept on marching when you should have stopped. There was all sorts of weird things. There was one thing I remember. We had rifle practice there. and. Uh, we were all lying, lying uh, down there, flat on our stomachs, pointing at the targets. Hang on a second. I just remember. Wait a minute. Here one. Yes, <laughs> that's right. I Wait, didn't. Hold on a second. I didn't have the faintest idea how to operate this bloody thing anyway. But uh, when I was lying there, all of a sudden I was kicked in the stomach, and I looked at her. This fellow said, "You get your hair because you're going to have a bloody power to your hair that long." <laughs> I said. My head lied, and I felt like saying, what's wrong with being a bloody poet anyway? <laughs> discretion was better part of valor, and I kept quiet about that. <laughs> that, was a, that, was a, that was my experience on the right range. <laughs> the next, next thing was we were, I remember with a great deal of fondness, we were told to, to we, were, we all got, got up at one, five o'clock in the morning, we were going on rifle sighting, I think it was called rifle sighting, what we did, we were, we were assembled, there were 15 of us, 15 to 20 of us, and we were told that we would, we would have to, to measure off distances by the size of the person away from us. So one fellow went away 100 yards. I could see, because I didn't forgot to say I was as blind as a bat. One fellow went off about 50 yards, another fellow went off 150 yards, then 200 yards, then 250 yards. By this time, I couldn't see any of them. I couldn't see any of them. And he, uh, my first, my first reaction was to melt quietly away, so nobody would see me anymore. But it didn't didn't work out that way, unfortunately. He, he called them all back again, and uh, we had to resume ranks. Well, I don't. That, there's nothing much more to say about that, except that it was now August. August 1940, and I was sent to, a, to a, a station, a Royal Air Force station, called Warmwell, in Dorset. There has been, a, a, there was nothing, there was nothing there at all, a few gorse bushes, and there has been nothing there for, for, for 1,620, or 1,420. Anyway, that was where we started basic, our basic training. And I remember very, really, very really clearly, August in 1940, and I was allocated to a tent, there were two other fellows there in the tent, and I sat down to write a letter, and I just sat down, I've arrived at a station called Warmwell, it seems very, very quiet here, and all of a sudden there were three bloody bombs dropped about a couple of hundred yards after, and it's frightened the life out of me. It's frightened the life out of anyone, that, 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 I mean, it was so quiet there, because what had happened, these, these Germans had gone up to a, a very high, a, a very strong, strong height, and cut the engines out, and coasted back to France, we were right on the coast, coasted back to France, quietly, and dropped the damn bombs as they went down. Well, that was our first smell, of cordite. Not very pleasant. Not very pleasant. Shall I go on about about another incident that happened to me? Uh, yeah, just talk about uh, you went to talk about when you went to Egypt and how that was when you got there and what it was like and flies, sand and flies. When did you find out you were going to Egypt? 
I was told I would go to Egypt and the embarkation date was January 1940, 1941. January 1941. Uh, by this time, I was an aircraftman, second class. Didn't mean a damn thing. But actually, you know, before before you went to Egypt, did you? So 1940 was that the Blitz in London or 41? Well, those two bombs dropping down were the part and parcel of the Battle of Britain. So did I, you? Did, so everybody was aware that London was being. I mean, that was. That was the beginning of it, or that was that was in in that at that time at around July or August, he was he was uh, he was attacking the the airdromes in England, trying to 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 pulverise them so that the air force could be were, were grounded, and it was it was then that, that he after he found the the, the, the biggest. The biggest debacle of the war was when he was he had a hundred god was hundred and eighty something planes shot down for a loss of only a twenty or twenty or thirty of ours. And by mistake, a couple of bombs were dropped by uh, by the English the Air Force on Berlin. And this drove this this actually this drove Hitler mad. And it was one of these factors that made him concentrate on bombing London. Is reprisal, and of course it was the stupidest mistake he could have made. Because if he kept on attacking the air, the air drones, maybe at two or three weeks more, he, he, he would have crucified us. We were absolutely, absolutely helpless. We put everything into the damn part into the Battle of Britain, everything. And back attacking London, that was his big mistake. His first big mistake. And God, that, that was a dreadful, dreadful business there. But by this time now, January. Uh, January 1941, I'd had instruction, uh, not instruction, we were supposed to, to Egypt. To so when you were in training, did you get to go up, did you go up to London at all? When I was in training? I went, did you have, before you went to Egypt, did you go to London any of that time? Or was that too far away? Oh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't go to London, no, I didn't go to London. I went, I went home to work, to, right. I went to Cardiff, on leave. And, uh, as I say, then, then I had my orders to, to uh, ship. The extraordinary thing, I, I, I missed this. this, this is ridiculous, really. I, while I was in Bridge North, I was in, I was in uh, the tent, the, um, the hut one night, and a voice came through at the bottom, the door opened, and a voice said, anybody here from Cardiff? And I thought, my God, I know that voice. And I said, I am. And he said, well, I'm buggered. <laughs> It was my cousin, David. <laughs> cousin David. I couldn't believe it. We were then sent on the same ship. We went on the same ship, which is a miracle in itself, with the thousands, hundreds of thousands of, thousands of us all uh, landed up there. But when we got to we got to Egypt, I was detracked to a place called 107 Maintenance Unit. But I had three or four weeks in Cairo. First of all, that was a, that was a miracle. That was gorgeous. I loved every minute of that. Opposite a cabaret, we were opposite a cabaret, and they used to, they used to play what the devil is a song. They they signed off with every night about two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning. I can't remember the song. That terrible. Can't remember what song they played now. And I heard it every night for, for, for three so, uh, three weeks, three three, three or four weeks. <laughs> anyway, the posting came then. I had to go to one of seven maintenance units, which was situated in the canal zone. The, the, um, uh, what do you call it now? Sewers? No, it wasn't Sewers. What was it? Was it the, not the Sewers canal. Um, oh, yeah, in the Sewers canal, yeah. Sewers canal area. Um, what did you, what did you think of Egypt? Because you've never been out of Britain before. I was, I was fascinated by it. I was fascinated by it. As I say, the, the, um, the, the bug bear with the damn flies and the bugs, not going to mention it. The bugs, the bed bugs. You couldn't get rid of them. Couldn't get rid of them. Um, well, then, let me see. Then David, David, cousin David, was posted to somewhere else. I don't know where the hell it was. And I was posted to Cas Casparit, was the name of the station. And I walked in there, into the... 
you have to report to the station warrant officer. God Almighty. God Almighty. That's the station warrant officer. And I walked in there and I said, uh, AC2 Lundbeck reporting, sir. And he stared at me. And he kept staring at me. And he didn't say a word. He kept out staring at me. And I felt more and more fidgety, more and more. At the end of the ease, was the last, the least of it. And he said, put your hat on. I said, I beg your pardon? Put your bleeding hat on. I said, I've got it. He said, put it on straight. <laughs> and what he wanted was the hat pulled down right, right down to the, uh, the eyebrows. You could barely see. <laughs> that was regulation. You could, these helmets we were, we were issued with, by the way, were issued in the Boer War. <laughs> they had they, uh, thousands of them uh, left over after the Boer War. And they issued these things, these silly things to us. <laughs> and he said, you don't know me, I'm Abby, I'm Art, my name is Art. They call me Happy Art. And I'm a bloody Happy Art, I'll tell you that. But if I catch you with anything at all, contrary to discipline, I'll have you inside soon you can say, well, I was terrified, I was terrified. He was like God Almighty to me. To any any uh, uh, newcomer to the uh, to the uh, to the unit, oh, he was a horror. God, he was a horror. That man. So, what did you do there? Usually, everything I was told. What was your job there? I was working in the, in the signals department. Um, I was allocated to a to a. Uh, posts, a listening, listening post, where which was which was incorporated in the, in the in a telephone exchange, um, and these said these lines were connected to pillboxes all around the camp. Pillboxes are concrete concrete uh, uh, shelters, which which had machine guns and um, an ordinary were manned by ordinary. Aircraft man. Uh, they were all dismounted all around the perimeter of the airdrome, and of course the idea was to um, to be on the defensive for the with these things. Um, were you bombed there? Was Egypt bombed? Oh, oh yeah. Well, no, not Egypt. I mean, the the, the Western Desert was where the, all, all the action was taking place. This was a maintenance unit, mm -hmm. uh, which meant that. Um, Aircraft which were which were, had been bombed or destroyed in, uh, or, or ruined in some way were sent there to be to be kitted out to be refitted refitted and um, how much did you know about what was going on with the war did they give you did you there was well well of course, how much were you allowed to know well we 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 we, we were a unit that that belonged to the uh, to the air force headquarters <coughs> and we had. We had uh, radios, uh, 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 which which were which were anchored into the um, the air, the air force headquarters in Cairo, so all the news bulletins used to be issued there to us from Cairo, and there were also also English newspapers, uh, English language newspapers. Um, so did you hear things like um, so when you went to Egypt, France had already fallen, right? Yes. And Italy was before France. Italy, Italy was on the verge of declaring war against against England. And did you? I mean, do you remember hearing about the Russians aligning with the Germans? Yes, we did. We had we had information about that. The news news broadcasts about that, and um, our reaction there was was one of, of complete despair. Because he thought that if Russia now was aligned with Germany, that was a terrific, a huge enemy force against us. We had, we had all the information about that. Um, and then, of course, Hitler, Hitler made, us another, made a bad mistake. He, he allowed the, 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 um, the bulk of the English air forces, the bulk of the English services, to, to get back to England from Dunkirk. That was his second mistake. His first mistake was in, in, in uh, issuing warfare against against the against Britain, in the Battle of Britain. His second mistake 
was to allow the, the um, services to escape to England after Dunkirk. That was his second mistake. His third big mistake was to, was to anchor himself to Bulgaria and to raise hell with Bulgaria because, because they were flip-flopping which way did they do it to go with, it, or go with England. And that, that, was about, that, that cost about a month to defeat them. And that was, that was his biggest mistake because that month was a month he had planned to attack Russia. And by the time he got to Russia, the Russian winter had set in. He delayed a, he delayed a month to, to teach Bulgaria a lesson. <laughs> and unfortunately, he, didn't, he got the wrong, the wrong end of the stick. Even he was one of who was, who was uh, beaten, who was, was given the lesson. Did you ever hear any? Uh, I mean, did you ever hear any whispers of uh, Nazi sympathizers in the for Air Force that you knew of? And mm. were there people who said they've got some right ideas or anything? Or no, no. You remember ever hearing that? No. But one thing, one a couple of things I did. Um, there used to be a lovely piano in the um, in the YMCA, and I used to go and practice it sometimes on the in the afternoons, two or three hours at a time. And while I was there, there was uh, there were some Italian prisoners of war who had who were allocated uh, to the YMCA to do general duties, cleaning up and that sort of thing. And I remember one of them, one of them taught me the fascist national anthem, and I picked it out on the piano, and uh, it got the right chords to it. It was called Giov Giovanezza, what the youth, youth. And um, I was a I was you know, playing this damn thing for them, Giovanezza. Jovanetta, da la 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 Jovanetta. They they thought it was quite a kind of thing. That was me and the wife who played playing the fascist national anthem. The piano was a good tune, very good tune piano. Do you think you were ever the one who was going to be 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 the one the dramatic society kind of stuff you had with your friends in the Air Force. Oh well, uh, we oh. had a, we had about five, four, no, let's see, about about five or six of us uh, with mutual interests got together, uh, literature, music, this sort of thing, and humor. Great, great sense, of, wonderful, wonderful sense of humor these fellows had, and um, as I say, we we were. Reminded about this the other day because when Deborah found a short story of mine that I'd written while I was in the Air Force and got 35 bob for it. <laughs> that was a real lark, that one. Um, and then I joined the Dramatic Society there. I played the part of Connor. Connor, was it? Connors? Connor? Uh, he was he was he he'd taken part in a, in a in a mail robbery ten years before. This was based on an Edgar Wallace story, and I had a I had a rough old accent. Well, that's a long time thing. That's very good. That that sort of thing. You can do some trouble. That's a bloody thing. I'll tell you. But I was bumped off in that in that first right the first act. <laughs> but the terror the, the terror we had a lovely effect because the the, the terror was a man a, it was a a, a man who'd gone berserk uh, during the war, who would, who'd set, would set up the, uh, the robbery of the ten, ten million pounds in gold. And we had a lovely scene um, where I, went, I, came, I crept on the stage, and it was in, in semi-darkness, and I was tapping around the walls, trying to find a secret entrance, and I gave a tap on the door, one, two, three taps on the door, on the door here, and the door pulled open, and there stood the terror, you know, a cowed <laughs> monk. And you could hear the audience, ah! <laughs> <laughs> and they had it in some boost out of it, I don't know. It was very, very gratifying, man. Eh? Very gratifying. Ah! So and he kept strangling me. <laughs> what do you remember about um, coming back to England? What struck you when you came back after all those years in Egypt? What was the first thing that was amazing to you? I don't know, really. Uh, when I was in, in Egypt, uh, at, at times, I felt a terrible despair. I thought, I'll never see England again. I'll never see England again. I, I just couldn't visualize seeing England again. And when we got back there, though, it, it didn't strike me as being in any way peculiar or odd or, or 
fresh to my eyes. It, it seemed exactly the same. It hadn't changed. Nothing had changed. The only things that were different were, were, uh, were blackouts, of course, and uh, uh, blackouts of the lights at night time. And, um, Did you go back during the war or you mean after the war? Uh, there was no more after the war, right? What, no I mean, more? After the war was finished when you went back to England. Oh, no, I, I went back to England in 1945. Oh. So the war still, still had about a year to go. Oh. Um, well, uh, I think as Mark Twain once said, it was an interesting experience, but one that I wouldn't like to go through it again. <laughs> and my two stock remarks, all my remarks were, as I've already mentioned, one, what did you do during the war? Anything I was told. But what were you during the war? Desperately unhappy. You were? Well, I was unhappy, and that's certainly most of the, a lot of the times, many more, much of the time. Well, it was, it was a very pleasant position to be in. I mean, there were the other fellows, the other, the other people felt the same way, despairing about seeing the, uh, seeing England again, and... Uh, Did you think Germany was going to win? Oh, no, no. Why not? <laughs> well, we were English. <laughs> <laughs> I think on that note, you could close. <laughs>